thank all of you for showing up this evening for our third event in the Faith and Justice Speaker Series. Um, we're very happy to be working with the Cleary <coughs> on, on this particular event. Um, this series kind of arose out of a desire to really interrogate the idea of what do what does the memory of the six men and two lay women who died um, 25 years ago this month in San Salvador, um, what does their memory have to say to us today at St. Louis University in our context in this city? And so we have done a series of, um, of events and we want to look at what does it mean to be a witness of faith in our community today. Because that is at the heart of what the Christian community understands a martyr to be. Um, and so this evening I have the very distinct pleasure of introducing Father Kevin Burke of the Society of Jesus. Um, I have known Father Burke my entire life. He is um, a close uncle of mine, but he is also, but beyond that, <laughs> I just want to get that out in the very front, the names are the same, but beyond that, he has studied these men and women, and particularly Ignacio Peña Perea, most of his professional life. His, uh, his doctoral dissertation, um, which was eventually published as um, The Ground Beneath the Cross, looked into the work and also the life of Ignacio Eatria. Um, he has continued um, to engage with those themes of what does it mean to be a university in our contemporary society. Um, so it gives me a really great pleasure to invite um, a great the theologian and a very dear friend, uh, Father Kevin Burke. But uh, that was really fun. I've been introduced in lots of different ways before, but close uncle, <laughs> that's a new one. I, I would be worried if it wasn't close. <laughs> Actually, John's dad and I grew up almost like twins. We've been best friends all our life. And so to uh, have my nephew, the uh, campus minister here at St. Louis U, working uh, in the faith that does justice is something like, pretty amazing. And uh, John was also a student at her school out in Berkeley. I teach at the Jesuit School of Theology. And I, as John mentioned, I've been, I've been thinking about these people. And I did my doctoral work on the thought of Ignacio de Korea, And he has been uh, just one of those people that ends up getting into your life in such a deep way, who not only his thought, his passion, his integrity, his sense about the world, his desire uh, to build a world that would be different, and then of course in community with all of these others, uh, his, his witness has had a huge impact on me. What's been interesting, two things I've noticed. One is that as the years have gone by, this event has gotten in some ways bigger and even more personal, for me at least, and I don't think only for me. You know, sometimes things fade, and I know that for many who are here, those of you who are college students, nearly all of you, I would presume, would have been born after this happened. And so it's like, okay, you came in, not just in the second reel, but after the movie was over, in a sense. It's like, what is, why are we making such a big deal about these people all these years later? And in a sense, that's the question I'd like to say a few words about. 
But uh, before anything else, I wanted to just call attention to the word uka, the uka martyrs. So, so uka functions like slu. <laughs> slu means senoshu, uka means Universidad Central Americana, and then it has the further name of Jose Sin and Canas. The university was founded in 1965, so they're celebrating their 50th anniversary this year. Now, in SLU's getting close to its 200th anniversary, and SLU's had a lot of interesting things happen in 200 years. I've uh, been suggesting that John learn about the time when the students took over the administration building back in the late 60s. There's some really interesting history here. And when I heard about the, uh, the Occupy SLU during these kind of recent weeks, I thought, that's unnerving, right, for a university? At the UCA, beginning in 1976, when Ignacio A. Correa published uh, an editorial in the, the, the university magazine called the Estudio Central Americano, so Central American Studies, published an essay criticizing the government for its uh, absolutely cowardly refusal to implement the land reform that they themselves had passed. So, the government had said we're going to do land reform. Certain vested interests in the very powerful families in the country didn't like it. The government buckled under. Aya Korea wrote an essay criticizing that, and a bomb went off on the campus and blew up the printing press. And between that event in 1976 and this event in 1989, the UCA had at least 15 bombs go off on the campus. In one occasion where military entered the campus and opened fire on students, killing several students. And then in this event, they came onto the campus of the university and took six Jesuit priests out of their beds in the middle of the night and executed them. Face down on the grass, five of them. The sixth one, the old man, Father Lopez y Lopez, with very bad hearing, didn't hear them banging on the door, but when they set off a bomb, he finally heard it. He went out to see what was going on, and then we realized, he says, oh, I don't think this has anything to do with me, and he kind of goes back in his room, and one of the soldiers followed him in and shot him. And then they discovered two women in a building right next to the Jesuit campus, the cook of the local seminary community, the Jesuit seminary community. She was the cook in that community when Doug Marcouille lived there as a student. And her 15-year-old daughter, they were staying on the campus that night in order to be safe because their house was right on the street and there had been a lot of shooting the night before and they were afraid of stray bullets and the like. The soldiers who were told to kill the Jesuits and especially to kill Aya Korea came onto the campus and did that and they were told to leave no witnesses. Okay, so that's the basic event. Think if that happened at St. Louis U. Now would campus ministry be busy? I mean, really, Occupy SLU was scary, was unnerving, was out of the ordinary. But honestly, compared to what the, our Jesuit University in Central America and San Salvador had went through in the 70s and the 80s, I mean, it's really quite astounding. And one has to ask, why? Why did this happen? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put up some slides and then just kind of talk about it as I move through. Uh, these are the eight martyrs. And Ignacio A. Correa was what we would call the president of the university, the rector. Ignacio Martin Moreau on the top left and Segundo Montes in the middle on the bottom uh, were both university professors, brilliant. One was a social psychologist, the other a sociologist. And they each ran, uh, Martin Barreau ran the public opinion polling agency and Segundo Montes, the human rights office. He was also deeply involved in the resettlement communities. So they were very involved politically, and these three, along with Father John Sabrino, would have probably been the main targets of this attack. The main target was the president of the University of Ignacio de Korea. The others, in some ways, were all collateral damage. Uh, Amado Lopez was a novice master, and uh, one, he and Juan Ramon Moreno were both great spiritual directors. And they were those kind of Jesuits that everybody loved and would seek out for spiritual direction. They would do a lot of mass and stuff. They were not as involved politically. Father Rodo was an older man. He was actually diagnosed with terminal cancer. 
And uh, he had helped found the UCA many years before, had recently founded the Fahey Alegria School System for Students for Children. He and the two women really were just witnesses. They were not at all involved in the, in the direct life of the UCA. Salinas, 15. And she was a freshman in high school, and she and her boyfriend were trying to get the courage up to approach her mother and see about getting married, which sounds awfully young to us, but actually in the context of rural El Salvador, is not that out of the ordinary. A brilliant young kid with a great future. And uh, the people that I knew who knew this family said, you know, when we lost her, in some ways, the tragedy is deepest there. You're talking about the future, all the possibilities, all the dreams that, that were lost. Well, these are the eight martyrs, but still the question why? Why would we take the trouble to think about them now? So I found myself thinking about this. It's one of the reasons I want to share this. This quotation comes from John Sabrina. In this quite trivialized and gray world, without utopia or dreams, it is important to meet persons who communicate light and inspiration by their manner of being. This enables us to be human and Christian. These persons must be sought out like the precious pearl, and thanks should be given when they are found. 1990, so this happened in the fall of 1989. In 1990, I was, I was a young priest. I was working at sister school of SLU, Regis University in Denver, Colorado, as a campus minister. So I had a job similar to my nephew's job. And the day we got the news, of course, was powerful and overwhelming. And I have to say, even at that moment, but especially in the days and weeks that went it, it, it felt like a death in the family. Uh, maybe the extended family. But to kill six Jesuit priests at another university just seemed completely over the top. And uh, that spring, in May of 1990, Regis University had as its graduation speaker, John Sabrino, the member of that community who wasn't killed because he was out of the country when the event occurred. He was in Thailand at a conference. And so John Sabrino, who had agreed about a year and a half before that he would come to Regis to do the graduation talk, decided to keep that commitment, and he came. And so what he said to the college kids who were there on their graduation day, uh, and as you can imagine, they're thinking about the parties and all these other things, and throwing, you know, throwing their hats and all that. And John says, well, look, I, I don't want to take too much of your time, but I want to give you the one thing that I think I have to give you that's worth giving, and that is my friends, the memory of my friends, my community. And he said, but I'm going to give them to you not because they were priests. It's not that they were better or more special or more holy than anybody else. It's not even that they were university men, and at least some of them, you, I think quite rightly, could be considered brilliant, which they were. But he said, that's not why I want to give them to you. He said, the reason I want to give them to you is because they were human beings. And he says, now that might seem odd. You might say, you know, we're all human beings. He says, no. He says, actually, to be a human being is a choice. It's a vocation. It is the essential vocation to really choose to be human. And he said, in this world with so much inhumanity, a world that tolerates the death in the thousands every day of children by starvation, when there's enough food to feed them, in this world with so much darkness, that there be people who choose to be human is worth noticing. And this quotation really picks up on that, that basic idea that these people give us light. They're like the precious pearl in the story that Jesus tells. And when we find people like this, we ought to pay attention because they can give us a clue about what it is we are longing for, how to be human in this world where that isn't necessarily easy. So that's the first clue of why I would want to share with you about these martyrs and why I'm so grateful, really, that here in the United States at these Jesuit universities, this year it's been very striking. 
all 28 Jesuit universities in the United States have made a special effort to remember these martyrs of a sister university in another country, San Salvador. And why? Because the intuition runs deep that there's something in these people that touches the very heart of this university and speaks to all of us, old and young, college students, faculty members, Jesuits, all of us, wherever we are, they show us something important. And so Ignacio Iacuria, A Grammar of Justice. This actually is the title of a book that just came out this fall that I had a, had a hand in. I was part of the, the group of scholars who've been meeting over the last six or seven years from different countries who have studied the thought of Iacuria. And we met in 2013 in San Salvador, kind of a colloquium in which we shared some of our papers with the idea of the hope that a book might come out of it. And the book, which in a sense, the title of the book is interesting because it's an allusion to a great, great Catholic thinker from the 19th century, Cardinal John Henry Newman, who wrote a very important book called The Idea, an essay towards, uh, well, first of all, he had the essay of a grammar of assent, and then he has a book on the university. What is the Catholic university? Well, these are two of the things that A. Korea was interested in. Grammar of ascent, in a sense, is talking about faith. What is the grammar? What kind of language will enable us to talk about God? And in a certain sense, that's what A. Korea gave his life to. Except for him, the grammar isn't just one that we formulate with words and with concepts, but it's a grammar that we formulate with our lives, with the way we live. Where do you put your body? Where do you put your energy? How do you invest yourself in this world so as to believe in its God? How do we live so that our living is a living unto God and in the presence of God? And by the way, this photo is actually really interesting. It was taken in February of 1989. So Aya Korea and his companions were killed in November. Right at the point in this terrible civil war, which had been going on for 10 years, where there was finally a little bit of space opening for public discourse. In the previous two years, for the first time, people began very cautiously to have a conversation about ending the civil war. And so one of the local television programs had a, a, a television show called, very kind of innocuously, Punta de Vista, Point of View, in which they would invite people to come. And the guy who ran Punta de Vista was always getting death threats just for having a television show about how to end the war. One of those interviews, it was a debate between Roberto de Busson and Ignacio de Correa. It's fascinating to watch. It's fascinating to watch this debate. Roberto de Busson was the founder of the Arena Party, the right wing party in El Salvador, and the godfather behind some of the worst of the death squads. And in 1992, when he was on his deathbed from cancer, the, the UN Truth Commission was doing its research on some of the worst human rights offenses in the last 15 years in San Salvador. And the probably the most notorious, the assassination at mass by the Catholic Archbishop, Monsignor Romero. Monsignor Oscar Romero. And the man who ordered that was Roberto de Busson. And what was interesting is A. Korea was willing to talk with everyone if it would help bring about an end to the war, even de Busson. Some of the Jesuits were really angry at him for talking to the enemy. And he just said, look, I'll talk to the devil that we're in peace. Space was beginning to open. And in February of 1989, for the first time in more than 10 years, there was a public gathering for reflection on what might the peace process involve. And 20,000 people gathered at the, in the center of the city at the place called the Monument to Salvador del Mundo, the Savior of the World. And Hey Korea was one of the speakers. And this photo was taken at that moment. 
And it was an incredibly politically significant moment. And Teresa Whitfield, in her great book on these events called Paying the Price, titles this chapter, Never So Close, Never So Far. They were this close to ending the war. And then the guerrillas started an offensive, and the Army High Command ordered the assassination of the Jesuits. And by the way, the soldiers who carried out that assassination were trained at the School of the Americas near Fort Benning, Georgia. It's one of the reasons this event, the killing of these Jesuits, was so closely associated with the urgent need to call into question the moral existence of that institution and to raise the question about how our own government was so deeply implicated in the events of this tiny country. 75,000 people lost their lives during the war. The Truth Commission found that more than 90% of them were killed by government and right-wing death squads, government soldiers <coughs> and right-wing death squads. In some of the worst of the massacres, El Mazote, the bullets that killed the 115 children that were herded into the sacristy and machine gunned to death were manufactured in Lake City, Missouri. It kind of brings it home. We paid for the bullets that killed the children. And that's part of the darkness of this story. It's a dark story. It implicates our world. It's part of San Salvador, El Salvador, this little tiny, little tiny country, became like the battleground of the so-called Cold War. And so, I mean, our government was hell-bent on keeping a communist government from coming in there. And, you know, the left had communist elements for sure. It had lots of other elements, too, including lots of Christian elements. The UCA was neutral. They, they insisted on staying neutral, but uh, they couldn't help but get drawn into the conflict. A. Korea was seen as an enemy because he was so articulate at exposing exactly what was going on. So uh, in November of that year, so close to a peace process, he was killed. So let me just mention something that was interesting. So for, in the background of the story are, of course, other stories. And I want to tell a story about a letter. Uh, I'll just tell you really quickly. I had this letter, a copy of this letter, on my computer for several months. And I just didn't go, I, I forgot. <laughs> I mean, it's going to take some work, it's in Spanish. And so, you know, and I put it aside and got busy doing other stuff. And I'm working on this book, The Grammar of Justice. And I remembered, I mean, the person who brought the letter to our attention was John Sabrino. He found this letter, came across it in the Romero archives. So the letter was written in April, on April 9, 1977. So what was the event? Well, here's the deal. There was a Jesuit priest, and his name was Rutilio Grande. He was a pastor of a parish of a city called Aguilares, about 90 minutes outside of San Salvador. He grew up in a little tiny town near Aguilares called El Paisnel. And he was on his way on a Saturday evening to El Paisnel, 10 kilometers away, 8 kilometers, somewhere, very close, uh, to say Mass. He was on his way to celebrate Mass. He was with an old man who was the sacristan, had the key to the church. And, uh, a 15-year-old boy who was the altar servant. And the three of them were machine gunned. They were ambushed and machine gunned to death on the side of the road. That's the event that really affected the heart of Archbishop Romero. Celebrating Mass that night with a crowd of more than a thousand people in the church back in our lives. Church packed, it didn't hold that many, so lots of people outside. About 20 Jesuits are there with the bishop, and it's like it's like 11.30 at night when they start the Mass. And uh, they have the three bodies laid out on a table right in front of the altar. And just bleeding right through to the floor. So Archbishop Romero celebrates Mass in the presence of the victims. And my own interpretation, a lot of people interpret this as the conversion of Archbishop Romero. My own sense is that he had an experience of the resurrection. That's what Eucharist is and what it does. It exercises our Eucharistic faith. And the, 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 the place where resurrection occurs is the victim. The resurrection is the resurrection of the victim. 
I mean, I think it's really interesting that the deep symbol of our resurrection thing is the cross. We don't try to do something like a horseshoe that would symbolize the tomb as the symbol of our faith. The symbol of the resurrection is the place where the death occurs. It's the resurrection from that. Or as Sabrina likes to say, it's not just the resuscitation of a corpse. It's the raising up and the, and the, and the you might say that, the overcoming of injustice and the raising up of the victim of injustice. That's what resurrection, that's where its, it's core is. So Monsignor Romero celebrates this mass, and he asks the people in there, the sisters and the priests, after the mass is over, it's 1 o'clock, 1 billion in the morning, he had, had a cup of coffee, and he says to all these people are gathered there, our church is being persecuted. <coughs> what are we going to do? And they all just were like, they didn't expect that from him. He was not identified as kind of on that, you know, on the side of the, of the kind of things that Rogelio was doing. He just said, will you help me? I don't know what to do. Somehow, out of that conversation that night, a decision, an idea began to take seed. Yeah, a little seed got planted in Bishop Romero's mind, and by Tuesday or Wednesday that week, he decided to act on it. That following weekend, he canceled all the masses in the archdiocese. Think if this happened in St. Louis. All the churches are closed this Sunday. We're going to have one mass in the entire diocese, and it's going to be at the cathedral. And if you can't make it inside the cathedral, then be outside, and we'll have speakers out there. And if you can't make it to the cathedral, then listen on the radio. And if you can't, if you don't have a radio, then you get a dispensation. The papal nuncio went ballistic. He told Monsignor Romero, you can't do that. It's against canon law. And Bishop Romero told me, canon law also says that I'm the bishop and you're not. <laughs> the Unica Misa, the one mass for Rutilio, on March 20th, 1977, there were more than 120,000 people in the square outside the cathedral. And nearly all the priests and all the religious priests can celebrate mass, well over 200, with the archbishop. Romero, I mean, what an act of courage. What an act of creativity. And what's interesting is, Ignacio A. Crea wasn't there. The day that Romero became bishop, February 22nd, a month before, he was refused entrance into the country at the border. It was illegal because he was a citizen, but he was still refused entrance. He tried three or four times to get in, couldn't get in. He went back to Spain, and he was waiting to try to figure out how to get rid of this. So anyway, he writes a letter to Bishop Romero from Spain. By the way, Bishop Romero died almost three, month, three years to the day as Rutilio. So he died in March of 1980. De Korea dies in November of 1989. What you have in this letter is a future martyr writing a letter to another future martyr about a martyr. Isn't that interesting? And what he says in this letter is so powerful. He talks about how Bishop Romero has, first of all, against all odds, has overcome fear and has acted in such a way as to call attention to where God is in this world. And Aya Kriya uses a line that is absolutely significant for him. He says, in your choices, I see the finger of God. It is something like quoting Vatican II saying, we need to read the signs of the times. And what Romero is saying is, I'm reading the signs of the times and I'm seeing them right here. And he also says, what I see that you've done, and he says, and this isn't easy, is you've built a church, and you've built unity in the church. So it's a, it's a very different way of, if we could just do church from that place where people's faith really comes alive, where God is saying, in the first place, let them have life. And so this letter, by the way, it sounded like a pure this. I don't know what finally woke me up to say this letter ought to be in the book. So it's the first chapter of the book. 
It's the first time that it's been published, and it got published in, uh, in English just this spring. So you've got this whole kind of uh, constellation of people and a story. And it's a story that implicates our own people, our own country in all sorts of different ways. And it has to do with the church. The story of this church is actually a very strong story for the larger church. It's really interesting how uncomfortable Bishop Romero makes some people and how others will say, this guy clearly is one of the great saints of our time. I don't think there's any question about that in the minds of the people of San Salvador. Year after year, they turn out for the anniversary of Bishop Romero in the numbers like 50, 60, 70,000. I was there for the 25th anniversary of Bishop Romero's assassination, and I was one of 250 priests can celebrate. In, a, in an audience, in a congregation, there was no church that could hold it. It was at Salvador and Orlando. They estimated the crowd between 50 and 60,000. And you know what the people started to chant? It makes bishops nervous. The people started to say, queremos obispos a lado de los pobres. We want bishops who are on the side of the poor. That's the sign that Bishop Romero gave them, that we are with you, that the church is with you. So why did they kill Ea Korea and his companions? By the way, this painting of the eight martyrs and a kind of a dark painting, very Spanish in a way, very Salvadoran, a kind of magical realism, the land of volcanoes of Salvador. This painting is in the chapel, the Romero Chapel, right next to the, to the theology center where the Jesuits were killed. They're buried in this chapel. Ea Korea and his five Jesuit companions are buried on the other side of the church across from this picture. And so why did they kill him? Why did he die? I ask the question that way because I'm really quoting an article that A. Korea wrote. He wrote an essay, Por que muere Jesus y lo, por que lo matan? Why did Jesus die and why did they kill him? And what he's doing in that article, and it's actually emblematic of his entire theology, is he's saying there's a difference between the two questions. And we tend very quickly to the, go to the question, why did Jesus die? And then we enter, well, for our sins. Jesus died to save us from our sin. But before we can get to the question of the theological meaning of the death of Jesus, we have to ask a question about our world. Who killed Jesus? Well, a group of people, it was a conspiracy, and it involved his own co-religionists, the people of his own faith community in the form of its leaders, the high priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, you know those folks in the Gospels? And of course, the, the power of empire. Jesus was killed by the Romans, not by the Jews. But he was killed by a conspiracy. And if we look and ask the question, why did they kill him? Why did they kill Jesus? And Korean say, before we spiritualize it, before we do, you know, turn it into a salvation theory, we first need to ask, what is happening in our history? They kill people who want to call us to live differently at the cost of organizing the world as we've currently organized. We've got a world organized in such a way that certain people have certain access and privilege and power and credit cards and the like. And think about our world with more than 2 billion people who don't know where tomorrow's meals will come from, who live very literally at the edge of death. This is business's world in our usual, in our world, business as usual in our world, and that's what Jesus is confronting. He's saying, you want to find God? We've got to remake the world in order to create space for God's dream for this world. Jesus, over and over, this is one of the most historically certain facts about Jesus, that his central theme of his preaching was the reign of God, the dream of God, of life and life to the full, of room at the table for everybody. And that dream costs. 
And it's interesting, all these years later, and Anacreta is one, and there are many, many, many others in our tradition, but we tend to remember them because of the way that they embody Jesus. Why did they kill him? Because he made the people in power uncomfortable, because they knew that if this man's dream began to be realized, their power would go down. They would have to share the country with all the rabble. That's why they killed him. Why did he die? I actually think Sabrino gets very close to that. There are those martyrs who die very much for the reasons that Jesus died. Uh, Sabrino calls them martyrs like Jesus. And they died for a people that Aacrea himself named a crucified people. He didn't talk about the poor. He talked about the crucified people. And where Jesus, he's so Jesuit, Aacrea, he's, he's just kind of like over the top Jesuit. He was a formation director, he was a retreat director, he was a spiritual director, and he was forever talking about spiritual exercises. So he said to this audience in Spain, these people have all done the spiritual exercise, he said, so here's what I want to ask you. You know how St. Ignatius says, in the first week of the exercises, place yourself before Jesus on the cross and ask these questions. Why did, why did, what am I doing for you? What will I do for you? What, what have I done? What am I doing? What will I do? So he says, well, I want you to ask the questions this way. Place yourself before this crucified people and ask yourself the question, what have I done? to help crucify them? What am I doing to uncrucify them? What will I do to see, what will I do to see these people raised up? He shifts the questions a little, but the point is, he makes an identification between the ones that Jesus says, as often as you do this for the least of my brothers and sisters you do for me, and Korea takes him in his word. And he says, they are the ones who show us where Christ is in why would we pay attention to this story and these people? Because it gives us a chance, a real fighting chance, to meet God, to meet the God of Jesus. So I want to tell you about the chapel at San Salvador. How many of you have been to that chapel, have ever seen it? So a handful have. Okay, good, cool. Few people have seen it. It's small. It's actually smaller. The whole church is a little bit smaller than this room. It's it's not terribly small, but and it's got a higher ceiling. Well, let me just show you this, and then I'll keep talking. This is what you see if you go in the chapel and turn around.
It's not your usual stations of the cross. But the 14 stations of the cross of the crucified people, the image of the crucified people, which takes the place of the traditional 14 stations and in a sense shocks us into the recognition of the violence that the one we call Christ suffered. The violence of our world. And that that violence is in our world. And it's part of the reality of it. And what is it that allows us in this world to find a word of love, a word of hope, to find in ourselves a reason for saying this world with all of its brokenness is still beautiful and is still worth our living, our serving, our embrace. Well, what it is, is that at the very heart of the mystery, we discover a God who wants to give life. And that is the very story from the beginning. And in every age, it gets reawakened. There are these people in our world who show us what it is to be human and where it is that we need the God of life. And that's why I think this event is so important. I think it's really interesting how, how instructive it's been for Jesuit universities in the United States because this university, as a university, made an option for the suffering people of San Salvador and of the whole country of El Salvador. They made an option to be a university on their behalf. But the option didn't mean that everybody left and went to join labor unions or you know this and that. No. The option is to do this as a university, in a university way, to make an option for the truth of reality, for the justice of society, and for a place where God's dream can be realized. And so how did that look concretely? Well, it meant things like founding the public opinion poll agency so that they could find out what do Salvadorans actually think. Let's not just assume, let's actually ask them. And the Human Rights Institute that actually studied the, the economy and looked at how the transactions were going on and followed the money during the war, which made the US State Department very uncomfortable. But the reason is it's because of the reality that if we're going to know the world of God, we need to know the truth of the world. And that's what a university is good at, is uncovering the truth. But uncovering the truth doesn't just mean you know, replacing ignorance with truth. I think that's what we usually think. Get a bunch of ignorant people in here and teach them something. No, the real job of a university is to confront the untruth. It's to unmask versions of reality that are false. It's to unmask false consciousness and to give us the courage to see the way things are here. That's what this university is doing. And so my question would be, what happens if we, in our own context, not trying to reproduce what this university did, with all of the complexity and understanding all the different forces that work in the university, what would it mean if we, as a university, made the same kind of commitment to the truth of our reality and the, and the reality itself where God is revealed? What would it mean for St. Louis? What would be the issues that we might want to focus on, well, the obvious ones of the, you know, what's going on in your city. I mean, we all know what's going on. And we know that SLU has been pulled into it in some ways. You know, SLU can't just be an innocent bystander. I think that's actually kind of cool. As uncomfortable as it might make us, I think it's really good that your university is in some way implicated in the reality of your city. I think that says something about this university. There's so much more. What's happening in our country? I would say that one of the signs of our times is that the civil society is so divided that we can't talk to one another across those things that divide us. Whether it's race, whether it's politics, whether it's parts of the country, red state, blue state, all of those divisions, all of that polarization paralyzes the human city. It builds walls right through the human city, 
like the Berlin Wall, ideological walls, so that we can't talk to each other. And what happens when you have those walls? Well, this is what I would say is what happens. Does faith have a body? It doesn't just have a soul. Faith has a body. And the body of faith is the human city. The human community. And if the human city is so divided that you cannot speak to those who are on the other side, you eliminate space for God. <coughs> There's no space for real faith. Why do our churches feel so empty? And why are young people in this society finding church the last place they would go to look for spirituality? Well, it isn't just the churches. It's the whole society in its divisions. And spirituality isn't something we can go running after like we can go chasing some guru. It's the real work as human beings of being human and of finding God. And that's why I find this parable, this church, this story so moving. So let me end. Let me end with the same poet whose, um, whose words appeared in that slideshow. Her name is Denise Levertov. She died about 15, 16 years ago. She was born in England. She married an American soldier and came to this country after the Second World War, raised her family here. She's one of the really important poets during the Vietnam years and for many years afterwards. She published 19 books of poetry just recently. Her collective poems were published, a brilliant uh, volume. And two important biographies of her have come out. She's really interesting. She's got, I mean, she's a person, she's one of these people as a poet who's, who's following what's going on in our world. And here's what's also interesting. For years, she found organized religion as just a gigantic embarrassment. And she was not in church for more than 30 years of her adulthood. She writes poetry of searching spiritual depth. But it was only very, very, very gradually that she came back to the practice, the overt practice of religious faith. And she grew grown up as an Anglican. She returned to the practice of faith in the Anglican Church. She had deep Jewish roots. Her father was a Hasidic Jew from Russia who read the Gospel of Matthew and became a Christian. He, he found the Messiah and always thought of himself as a Jew. Denise, with these powerful roots, is writing poetry that speaks to the difficulty of believing in her day. In one of these amazing poems, she writes this. I'm just going to paraphrase part of it, not read all of it. I've been listening years now to last breaths, murders, dying, passionately, in open blood, in closed cells. From a long way off, I listen. I look. I listen, I look, only to say to the others, watch, hear them. Through them alone, we keep our title, human. Word like an archway, a bridge, an altar. Word like an archway, a bridge, an altar, where things can be united, where people have a place to dwell, where we can once again recover the holy, in the human, in our own flesh, where God would meet us, the very heart of the Christian story. And I find it really interesting about Denise Levertov. She met the Jesuits in, the, in, uh, Spokane, or in uh, Seattle, where she moved towards the end of her life. She joined the Catholic Church in a Jesuit parish in Seattle because she said, 
You know, if there's enough room in this church for Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton and Bishop Romero, there's actually probably room even for me. Her poetry friends are still scandalized. All these years later, they think, well, she lost her, she went off her rocker. Well, actually, she didn't. She found a place where we could celebrate and think and live and act. But it's constantly got to be recreated. It's got to be one in every age. And that's why we need the martyrs. They show us how to be human. They remind us. And so let me end with these words by John Sabrino, this uh, beautiful sunset photograph from San Salvador. He was writing a letter the year after Aeokrea was killed, and he wrote to Aeokrea, his friend, the inmost steps of you, your guts and your heart wrenched at the immense pain of this people. That's what never left you in peace. That's what put your special intelligence to work and channeled your creativity and your service. And you see, it's the combination of intelligence and creativity and service that a university is all about. And where we have the opportunity to unite in our own lives intelligence, creativity, and service, action, working for a better world. And so all these years later, 25 years after these murders died, the work continues. It continues there, and it continues here. And it will continue. That's the way it is. And the good news is, in this world with so much darkness, in this world with so much complexity, in this world where it can be very hard to be human, it is possible to be human. We can choose. We can find God there. And we can build a human community starting from here. And that's why the martyrs are good news. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> uh, we still have about 20, minutes. 20 minutes for questions. Um, so Happy to do it. There's a mic, even. And you know what? They always say questions. But I think what's really interesting is your comments, or if you have your own version of events, even if you disagree. Uh, I'd really be interested to hear what you might want to have to say. Did uh, Father Sabrina go back and work at UCA after the... Yes. When he, was, when he came back, so did the question, did Father Sabrina go back to Luka? He was in Thailand when the event occurred, and then he came to the United States, and he actually stayed with the Jesuit community at Santa Clara University for about three months. And then when it was deemed that it was safe enough that he could go back, he went back to San Salvador. When I met him that spring in Denver, uh, I was a young priest there at Regis, and I had dinner with him one evening, and I asked him about that. I said, gosh, you went back to San Salvador? And I said, I was kind of asking him, well, how did you do that? Weren't you afraid? And he said, look, I would be ashamed not to go back. These are my people. He says, but he said, but listen, I understand. I, I think I understand what the real question you're asking. He says, you're a young priest. And in a sense, what's behind your question is, what is the meaning of our commitments? You know, of being a priest or being a Jesuit or being anyone who's a believer. What is... What really is, he says, in my country, it would never occur to me to ask the question, what is the meaning of my priesthood? Because it's so obvious. <laughs> but he said, but that's the question that tortures you. And so I, I asked him, well, what is the meaning of your priesthood? And he said, I'm a priest for my people. I'm a Jesuit for my people. That's the meaning of my life. Of course I would go back. So and he's been there since. He was just out at Berkeley this, uh, this spring and gave our graduation talk at, at my school, which I was really grateful for. And I had a hand in translating the talk. It got published in America Magazine 
earlier this month. Uh, very, very strong talk on a number of themes that Aquina had developed on a civilization of wealth and a civilization of poverty. Other thoughts? Questions? Could, could you compare how uh, these martyrs were viewed by the larger society, in particular the powers in the larger society, the day before they were murdered, is that how they're viewed today? You know, that's a really good question, and I, I, I think I would only be guessing. I mean, I don't really have data. Uh, I, I, uh, that's, it's just a cool question. So how were they viewed then, and how were they viewed today? I think there were many people in El Salvador who really thought they were enemies. But that's because they'd read a bunch of stuff. I think there are still people, wealthy Salvadorans, in, in that country and in this country, who still think these guys were despicable. You know, and who will tell you, you know, they'll just tell you they were involved, they were involved with the communists. Even though that wasn't true, they'll say it was true. And I mean, you know, once people get certain ideas in their minds, it's sometimes hard to get them out. What was, what's interesting, though, is to notice what happened in the Jesuits. See, Vatican II wasn't easy. And for those of you who are younger and don't remember those years, those of us who are like old, we remember. The Vatican II getting implemented led to lots of divisions. And we had things like the prayers of petition that would be sort of like red state, blue state, prayers of petition. <laughs> the Vatican II people and the pre-Vatican II people and this sort of thing. And believe me, in San Salvador, it was difficult. There was a lot of division in the province, the Central American province. And Aya Korea and the former novice master, Elizondo, led a retreat in 1970, so this is quite a bit earlier, in which they got the, the province to think about how they were going to implement Medellin, which was the bishops' conference meeting that asked the question, how are we going to implement Vatican II? So Vatican II, 65, Medellin, 68, the retreat was 1970. There was a lot of division. But at that retreat, the majority of the vice province of San Salvador, of Central America, agreed that the province would make an option for the poor, and that that option would be in every institutional work of the society. The province remained divided. The divisions remained until November 16, 1989. And whatever else happened, those divisions ended that night. And that was actually told to me by one of the provincials of Central America. He said, we've had a lot of problems, and the problems didn't all go away. We lost a lot of locations. He said, we, we continue to have things that are difficult. That's just the human condition. But he said, those divisions find them. Yeah, thanks. That's a cool question. I've never had that one. Others? Any thoughts? Other things? Back here, John. Uh, could, you, could you say anything about the um, how Rutilio influenced Romero before his death, the, the couple years before that? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually an interesting story, and there's more that's still coming out about the story of Rutilio and Monsignor. Because here's one of the things that you need to know about them. They were both Salvadorans. Ea Correa and the other Jesuits, except for Lolo, uh, Father Lopez y Lopez, he was Salvador, but the five others who worked at the Uca were all Spaniards. Ea Correa, as was Sabrino. They came from Spain, they were, and there was this kind of Spanish local church tension. And the Spaniards were pretty smart, and they liked being in control. I mean, they weren't, all, they weren't perfect either, right? Rutilio, was a Salvadoran. He is also, uh, you know, he's a very humble guy, and he was a guy with a lot of uh, self I think he had some health issues. He had a very, very serious nervous breakdown when he was in the seminary, and he was actually catatonic for several months. Came out of that, got his health back, went on to be ordained, had a lot of scruples. In many ways, I think Monsignor Romero could see in Rutilio a priest like himself. 
and there was a natural friendship there. Rutilio was the master of ceremonies when Bishop Romero was first made a bishop back in 1972. But uh, as Rutilio and the Jesuits began to implement that retreat in, from 1970, and in the parishes that meant literacy campaigns, teaching people to read the Bible and to see themselves in the story, it's a very Jesuit thing to do, and then to ask the question, why are our kids dying of diarrhea? That's a very, very dangerous question in those contexts. And the people who were the leaders in the Bible study groups in Rutilio's parish started to show up as the leaders in the farmer community. <clears throat> and that made the landowners angry. Bishop Romero was nervous with what Rutilio was doing. He wasn't sure that he was on board with this program. And so he would ask Rutilio to explain it to him. But deep down inside, I think he trusted him. And I think that Romero never needed to be converted to the people. He'd always cared about the people. But he just didn't know how to see the society with its divisions. He never asked the question, why are they poor? He saw the world in these rather static terms. And Rutilio was seeing them more in these dynamic terms of asking, not just doing, not just giving them charity, but asking why are they poor in the first place. And once Rutilio was killed, it was, it was heard of Bishop Romero that he said, Rutilio was right. Rutilio was asking the right question. And that was why the people in El Salvador talked about Rutilio's first miracle was the change in Bishop Romero. That, and and it, they describe it in very dramatic terms. Uh, Sabrino does, Martin Barro in his writings. Uh, and, and I remember talking to Monsignor uh, Ricardo Urioste, who was Romero's right hand man. We were at a conference together at Notre Dame about 10 years ago. This guy's a beautiful human being. He's an older priest now, he's retired. But he told the coolest story about Romero when they were working on the pastoral letters. And, and Korea helped write the fourth pastoral letter on the way that civil society would be organized, people's right to, to found things like unions and teachers' co-ops and this sort of thing. And where ought the church be, you know, in terms of its relationship to these various groups? So what happens when your when your Bible group leaders become the leader of a farm worker union? Is that okay? And so this very complex question about the organization of society. And Anne Korea helped write it, but Romero said, we can't just have a bunch of scholars write this letter. We need to take it to the people and have them help us write it. And so they had listening sessions all over the diocese, everywhere they went. And then they had to collate all this stuff. And so there was a team working at the seminary, collating all these answers. One night, Ricardo Urioste said, he and Romero were leaving the meeting. They'd been there for four hours. They hadn't had dinner yet. It's 10 o'clock at night. They go out of the seminary grounds, and as they're heading out down the steps, Rioste turned to talk to somebody. Romero went ahead of him a couple steps, and he saw a beggar sitting there. And so he goes over to him. And Rioste just assumes, oh, he's going to give him some money or whatever. But actually, what Romero did was go over and said, hey, you know, inside we're discussing the pastoral letter. What do you think about? And Ernie Oste said, Monsignor Romero had this great gift. He could give something even more than money. He told him his opinion mattered. He gave him the dignity of recognizing him as one of the voices in his diocese. I think that was part, I think part of that was Romero's own deep mysticism. But I think the awakening that, that Rutilio helped give him was a sense that our loving actively in this world means engaging people in terms of the things that are creating the society the way it is. And that's part of the change, that Romero can write those pastoral letters. And by the way, they're translated into English. There's four of them. They're really, they're really worth reading. They're very, very powerful. So any question, thanks. Yes, hi, Julie. Hi, Jim. You said that, um, 
Oh, well, here's the here's the one. Oh, you said all the Jesuit universities had remembrances this year. I, I know this is a big question, but do you think that we are moving closer to a Korean vision, or are we moving farther away in some way? Yeah, are we moving closer? Or are we moving further away? It is a big question, and I don't have enough data to give up. Any, I would just be making it up now. As a theologian, I make up a lot of stuff. You know, that's kind of our stock and trade. If you don't have the data, don't let that stop you. But, uh, here's what I actually think. I think that our Jesuit universities here in the United States are at a real Kairos moment. Because in the next 10 years, you know, really the, the visible presence of Jesuits at Jesuit universities is going to become very, very small. Most of the presidents will not be uh, Jesuits. There won't be that many Jesuits in the classroom or in the you know, university administration. So will they be Jesuit in some real sense? Will they be a nation? Will they really take hold? I actually think there's a way in which this moment that we're in is pregnant with possibility. Because as long as you had a whole bunch of Jesuits living over there at Jesuit Hall, you could basically outsource Jesuit identity at the university to that group of guys living in that building. And then everybody else could not worry about it. We don't have to do Ignatian mission and ministry and identity. But now, in a certain sense, if the university in some real way is going to live this vision, not only faculty, but students, and staff, and campus ministers, and friends, and others need to work together to talk about what is going to be this vision. I think it's interesting that the universities have grabbed a hold of this image that if faith today is going to be real, it will be a faith that does justice, or it won't be real. And I think that's a big change. And I think it's a real change, and I think it's across the board, and it's not just the universities, it's in the high schools too. But whether or not that justice has the power to carry faith is the further question. What I find when I give talks to university administrators and faculty is they're really willing to talk justice with me. But they get real nervous when I say, well, let's talk about the faith that does justice. Because they think I'm going to dump, data dump, this big infrastructure of thought on them, and I'm going to start telling them how to think, how to vote, how to do blah, 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 instead of saying the key to faith is that we build a human city, and that we find room for different voices, and that we learn the art of really listening to difference. Because we're not going to all agree. We're not, I mean, Jesuits haven't always ever <laughs> agreed about what ought to be a Jesuit university. Just get a group of us together and check it out. We don't agree. I mean, we have, because we're human. And, it, and it, all being in, in agreement, no, what's really important is that we love each other enough to listen to each other's point of view. And how do you do that in a university of 15,000 people? and a gigantic annual budget, and all these stakeholders. All I know is it's hard. I was a dean for six years of a tiny little school of theology out in California, and I aged in dog years. <laughs> I mean administration, university administration, is one of the hardest things in the world. It's really, really hard. But it's worth doing, and so I just say, Listen to your administrators. You know, their lives are not easy. Give them a break. But challenge them and continue the conversation. Will these schools still be recognized to be a Jesuit 10 years from now? I don't know. But I do know that if they are, it'll be because of people like you and all of us. And hopefully a few of us, you know, who are Jesuits. Maybe one last? Yeah. I think it's interesting now, I didn't know if it was Romero or Ignacio who said, who talked about the church of the poor. Mm. And that now, 
from 1977, 1980 to the present moment, we have a pope who is saying yeah. we are the church of the poor for the poor. Yeah. That we've not had anybody publicly say since the Medellin conferences in 68 that where's our option for the poor? Yeah. Actually, I think it's a little more nuanced than that. Because, for example, the conference that met in Puebla in Mexico in 1979, and Pope John Paul was there as a very, very newly elected pope, that conference also made some very powerful statements and for the first time used the language of the option for the poor. And the person who basically canonized the language of preferential option for the poor in magisterial discourse was John Paul. And that's actually, he deserves to be remembered for that. That's really, really important. So it's not that simple. He did talk about the poor. He, he didn't do it quite the way that Francis did. I mean, Francis has a style that, I don't know. Okay, he's a Jesuit. <laughs> you, could take, you, could, you could make him a bishop, but he's still a Jesuit. <laughs> some, some real sense. No, I'm, I really think it's all more complex than this. And I think we're still a long ways away from realizing what it would mean to be a true church for and of the poor. And I think we need to think that it. Dave Chris said this about the university. To make an option for the poor doesn't mean that only poor people study at the university. But what it does mean is those of us who do study here make it a point to make sure the poor people have a voice. That we do science so that they have science. And we, we do human rights research so that their human rights, who are most in danger, are actually realized. So how do we do this as a church? Well, I do think there's a different moment. And I do think that you could talk a lot about you know, images of church. It's not that I, I, I have to work hard at this to not divide, even within the church, into the ones I agree with and the ones I don't agree with, or the good guys and the bad guys, or the left wing or the right wing, or the pre-Vatican or the Pope. And to, and to say, listen, everybody's holding, trying to hold on to something real, something valuable, something important. How do we listen? How do we do that? I think that's part of the real art of being human. And I, one reason that I really admire Ed Korea, with all of his strong opinions, he still listened to people he disagreed with. He was always willing to listen. I haven't always been willing to listen, even to people I agree with. So, I mean, that's how hard it is. The last thing I'd like to say is this. I've come to the opinion, especially in this last couple of years, going back to A.A. Curry's work, that in talking about him as a theologian, we're talking about somebody who's literally on the level of a Karl Rahner. He's really brilliant. And I think of him dying at the age of 59. Those of you who are university people can appreciate this. In the 10 years that he was president of the university, he still taught sunglasses. He managed to edit two major publications. And he published 100 articles. Oh, that makes me sick. I mean, that's just over the top. Yeah, hardly ever. I mean, I think he was a workaholic. I think you could say a lot of things. But I also think he was really brilliant. And I think he wrote a lot of those articles on the first draft and published. I think he was just really, had an incredible systematic mind. But he didn't publish books. He wrote articles because he's responding to concrete moments, concrete situations. And his articles range from real dense philosophical texts. He was editing his former teachers works for publication after that man died in, in the mid-80s. And he's, and, he's, and he's writing the one systematic work that he wrote, the philosophy of historical reality, while he was in exile from El Salvador the second time. So he does, he's just writing all the time. But he's writing on politics, economics. He's writing on the peace process. He was the guy when the president of El Salvador's daughter was kidnapped by the guerrillas in 1985. It was A.A. Korea who negotiated her release. He was amazing. And he published 100 articles there. He was 59. 
it's hard to say this, but he's younger than I am now. And what would he have published in those subsequent years? 25 years later, he would only be 84. Only in 84. He would be a relatively young man still, right? Yes. Hi, right, John? Yes. And see, here's the thing. What were we, what was taken from us? A lot. A lot. And I think, I think we're talking about someone with a brain like Carl Rahn. Brilliant, brilliant person. But I think his greatest essay is his life. And it's always the case with people like this. I think it's true of Romero, I think it's true of Rutilio, I think it's true of the church women, who, by the way, I think should be canonized with, with, without a second thought. And their word, their witness, is a gospel, and it helps the faith to continue. And that's why I'm glad we celebrate them. So thanks so much. Thank you very much for coming to this. <laughs>